All right, I think we're good to go. So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining our interview series today. In our previous two interviews, we were able to expand our knowledge of the IT and law industries by speaking to Babar Akilhanov and Rahmat Sabirov. And our guest today is lovely Shahina Polatova, a speaker, a writer with rich product management experiences at LinkedIn, Eventbrite, and eBay. So Shahina is an ambitious professional who's constantly seeking for new ways to improve and grow both personally and professionally. On top of that, she regularly gives lectures and hosts events to share her product management knowledge with young professionals interested in the field. While personal growth is important, the will to share that knowledge with others is something we value a lot here at Uzbek Diaspora. And therefore, we're extremely excited to have Shahina join us today. So thank you very much for that, Shahina. And uh, without further ado, we can get started. Uh, I'll just do a quick intro of our board. If you guys are not already familiar uh, with the board, Shahlazi Adelaiva is our marketing specialist. Sardar Ahmedov is our IT specialist. Begzad Kabir of public relations specialist and Hassan Raimjanov, our finance specialist. Just a quick reminder, um, this session is expected to run for 45 minutes and we will have a 15 minute Q&A uh, at the end of the session. So, you know, you feel free to leave your questions at any point of the interview and we'll address them at the end uh, and try to keep them around Shahina's expertise of business as, as well as her Uzbek diaspora experiences abroad. So without further ado, Shahina, I'll pass it on to you to briefly introduce your, yourself to the audience. Yeah, um, hi everyone. Um, thanks, Shahada, for an amazing introduction. Um, my name is Shahina Bulatova, um, and I, I grew up in Uzbekistan, um, in Tashkent, lived there for 17 years, um, completed high school, and moved to the United States um, in 1999. In the U.S., um, I've lived in Knoxville, Tennessee initially, and then moved on uh, to Austin, Texas, and then in, uh, for the past nine years, I've been living in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, professionally, I'm a product leader, and I focus on building consumer products. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of it focusing on artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, recommendations, search and discovery, um, uh, that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's that's it for now. That is awesome. And could you tell us a little bit more about your education, maybe your degrees, your major in college, and also your transition from college to your career, what that, that process looked like for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my background is in computer science. So I studied computer science both uh, for my undergraduate degree and in grad school. Um, but leading up to it, actually choosing computer science was not um, a straightforward thing for me. So I, when I was growing up, um in my during high school um actually i was part of this special uh, kind of experimental group um in high school where they did this joint partnership with the university uh, it was called Tajgu at that time and I, uh, now it's uh, national university of Uzbekistan. so uh from grade nine through 11 we would go um, a couple times a week we would go to um to the university and we would study uh, like real professors right there they would teach us um, computer science mathematics and english so that was super interesting um we were actually studying the curriculum of the first and second grade uh, first and second you know bachelor and um of the bachelor degree um so that really shed interest into programming for me and uh, even before that growing up as a kid uh, we had computers at home my father was a mathematics professor and researcher and through his work he brought in a lot of computers and as a kid uh, initially of course i um, learned how to you know i i, I use this for gaming but very soon after my dad's um, students taught me how to uh, how to use the computer for initially for like things like printing or and, and word processing and that sort of thing uh, but then eventually to um, coding um, in Pascal and basic and that sort of thing. So um, throughout that time, uh, my interest in computer science just in overall kind of technology grew, but for some reason I thought computer science is not for me because my eyesight was not great. So like my assumption was that 
you know, hey, I, my eyesight is kind of poor. I was already wearing glasses when, when I was like in first or second grade, which for some reason in Uzbekistan is actually very rare. I don't know what the situation right now uh, is right now, but everyone seemed to have really great eyesight there. Um, but I, I probably was like the, like, one of two people in the whole school who actually wore glasses. Anyway, so like my assumption was that computer science is not for me because I would have to work, you know, in front of screens all the time and that mm-hmm. would, like, my eyesight is already poor. And uh, at some point my dad asked me, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up, right? Like, have you picked a profession yet? Um, I was a straight A student all through school. So I had so many interests, right? I could just go, you know, and, uh, pers- and pursue any, um, any field of study. But I said, well, like computer science is not for me because, you know, um, it's not really for me. And he's like, no, don't discount that. Uh, like screens are getting better. And actually, computer science has a lot of opportunities, um, software engineering and so on. And uh, there's a lot of potential there. So why don't you pursue that? Uh, so I decided doing that and uh, I did not um, want to continue my studies in Uzbekistan. So I decided to uh, move to the U.S. Um, to to start college, and I ended up at the University of Tennessee um, uh, in Knoxville uh, and studied computer science there. And then for grad school, um, I focused on a lot of data mining, machine learning, um, kind of algorithmic sort of fields, uh, thanks to my professor, uh, thesis advisor, who exposed me to that field, for which I'm super grateful. Um, and uh, did a lot of focus on bioinformatics, computational biology, sort of things as well. And my thesis was around that. Um, so that's how uh, essentially I ended up taking the major and getting into that field. Uh, of course, like transition to career um, after graduation, um, I was recruited from a former student um, who, uh, you know, from University of Tennessee to a company called National Instruments in Austin, Texas. And of course, a natural transition for a computer science graduate was to become an engineer. So mm-hmm. I became an engineer, did that for a couple of years. Um, and then um, f- for me, it was really kind of, I get bored really easily, right? So for me, just realization that, okay, I know how to code, what's next, right? And um, I really got interested into the why and what behind building products. Um, and the vision and strategy involved um, and uh, really like solving problems, right? Like what problems do you tackle and how do you solve them? That sort of thing and discovered the, uh, the product management um, you know, area um, and tried a project within my company and really loved it and moved on um, full time to product management role. Oh, wow. That is a very interesting journey. I see that we're already getting questions because you had such an interesting journey and you had so many different uh, experiences. So um, where do you stand in terms of your career now? Are you still working for a company? Are you working on any projects? Yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, so I've, um, I am a product leader. And I have um, 16 years of experience at this point, 14 of which have been on product um, and then the initial engineering experience. Um, and, you know, given my background in AI, I f- uh, focused a lot um, on the AI field and machine learning field and uh, focused on building um, search and discovery products, recommendations. Um, merchandising and algorithms and like anything that has to do with algorithms, right? Like machine translation, uh, NLP, that sort of stuff. Um, it's been such an incredible journey for me, such, um, you know, a great learning experience, um, and a very challenge, challenging, but rewarding. Um, and then like after, you know, like as I got matured in the field, um, I pursued re- leadership roles and, um, my last um, uh, experience at LinkedIn has been uh, been a head of, head of product for identity and reputation products that includes um, on LinkedIn via profile, you know, how you, when you view it and edit it, everything get, gets into it, and the whole e- skills ecosystem, uh, you know, how like skills have become really the currency you deal with, right, in professional environments uh, and in the talent economy. So really focusing on, you know, how do we represent members' skills in the best way possible um, and so that they can get discovered for opportunities. Um, so we, we did, uh, you know, products like skills assessments and that sort of thing. So um, two years ago, um, I decided to take a sabbatical and um, 
uh, focus on co-writing a mathematics book. So that, uh, of course, is a very different kind of transition to, uh, you know, from my, you know, heavy tech product role. Um, it's been such an amazing journey. So my, like I mentioned, my father uh, was a mathematics, mathematics professor and several years ago, he got really fed up with how uh, math education, um, right, has been progressing over the years, which honestly, there hasn't been much progress at all. Um, and he took on the challenge of completely reimagining math education. Um, and uh, like this, uh, this was supposed to be for, um, you know, K, K through 12 and beyond, college level and beyond. Um, and rec he recruited me, right, to help him. So, you know, when I had a full time job, it was kind of hard to focus on that. Um, uh, although I did try, um, but I decided to take on the sabbatical to, to focus on it full time. Uh, unfortunately, three years ago, my father passed away, and that was a, it was, it's a very personal mission for me as well to complete his work, right? And we've been, you know, collaborating at that time, and now I'm kind of, I feel like I'm collaborating with him, you know, beyond time sort of a thing so um it's been incredible and um and i decided well i can do that i can travel the world and uh, traveling has always been my passion and um and i could write from anywhere right so um I, I started, uh, I actually started my journey back from Uzbek in Uzbekistan because I said, I thought about, well, like, I want to rediscover my roots, right? I really want to kind of, you know, I, I've traveled back and forth in the past 21 years I've been in the U.S., uh, you know, kind of, you know, once or twice every couple of years, you know, that sort of thing. I go there, but um, always for just a week or two, uh, so it's really nothing. But this time I actually stayed there for two months um, and really gotten into the culture and, you know, kind of rediscovered my roots, so to, so to speak, um, traveled a lot within Uzbekistan. Um, and then from there, um, I went to South Africa, uh, right to Morocco, to like to Europe, you know, Portugal and Spain and Berlin, and then from there to Japan um, and Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on. Um, all all throughout, the, then went back to Europe. Like I did a lot of conference talks um, and uh, advised startups as well, and kind of got in touch with professional communities, tech communities in these countries as well. Uh, and then lastly, I was in Latin America in Peru. Um, I got to visit Machu Picchu, which was incredible. Um, and then, um, you know, have been back. And of course, uh, unfortunately, pandemic hit, so I could not travel any longer. So I've been in San Francisco at this point. Um, still focusing on writing the book. But um, yeah, it's it's been such an incredible journey, like getting to know the people in different cultures. And when I travel, I actually try to really um, soak in all the culture, and I, I want to feel like I'm I'm like a local, right? Like I'm actually like living there instead of just visiting and kind of um, marking the check boxes um, on the places I went to visit. Um, and I, I guess I'm turning into a writer at this point. Um, uh, it's 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 been a, a, a crazy transition. It's very different uh, from my regular, you know, product building tech world, but I've been enjoying it uh, incredibly. Wow! After everything I heard, I have so many questions for you, but I will try to go in order. So uh, I just wanted to um, bring up a point about um, I know you mentioned your father and how you took over the book. Um, when we posted your flyer, we actually received really good comments from various people who said they knew your dad, what a great person he was, and that they know you and what an interesting person you are. And I think we're all finding out about that right now. And uh, talking about the book, you know. This is your first book that you're writing, right? I actually, when I was a student in grad school, um, uh, together with my professor and a few um, fellow grad students, we published a book. It's, it's called um, Lecture Notes and Data Mining. So I have a couple of chapters published in that oh, book. Wow. And like other like articles published and that sort of thing, uh, more like scientific uh, computer science articles. But yeah, like technically, I do have a couple of chapters in the book already. And also, actually, when I was um, when I was a kid and uh, started, you know, getting interest into um, to the American culture, and I just made up my mind for some reason when I was like eleven or twelve, I can't remember that I wanted to move to the U.S. 
Um, one summer, I, you know, in summer breaks, right, in school, yeah. like, basically people are just, you know, um, are completely free. There's, there was, I guess, like, maybe there were some summer camps and that sort of thing. But anyways, my dad sat me down and he said, hey, like, do you want to learn English together? Right? So he, he, he had been learning English by himself, but um, I, I guess it was great for him to have and, you know, someone to check, you know, to, to kind of, uh, to have some sort of a companion yeah. that we each other on, on, on our vocabulary and that sort of thing. So we actually started learning English together. And um, eventually he said, well, you know, like um, to master the language, you need to start teaching it. So I, I um, started tutoring in kids initially and actually like older, you know, students, um, you know, friends, friends, like a cross friends and family and that sort of thing. Um, so that was great. But then after that, he said, okay, now the next step is that we need to write a book together. So we wrote um, a book uh, in English um, uh, uh, to, for teaching English, uh, focusing on English grammar. Um, and of course, he's a mathematician, so it was like a very structured kind of mathematical approach um, for teaching the English language. Um, but I helped, um, I helped him um, on that, and we published it and became a, soon became a bestseller and got translated. It was written in Russian. Uh, teaching English, uh, and then soon after it got translated to, to Uzbek as well, I think. So how old were you then? I was maybe 15, 16. Oh, wow. I was just playing outside when I was 15, 16. That's amazing. What's the name of the book? I wonder if I've heard of it. Um, I think it's just called Angliski Yazyk Uchebnik Ispravichnik. Okay. Uh, I think that's the name of it. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's, it's probably not in print anymore, but I'm not sure. Oh. Okay, well, that is awesome. That's amazing. So I guess um, my next question would be, you know, now that you're writing this math book, what are some challenges that you're facing? What would you say are the hardest parts of writing this kind of book? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so this is uh, the, the overall kind of the thesis that we're going after is that, you know, how math is uh, in general is perceived as um, a tool for computation and calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Like in school, you just try to learn as many formulas as you can. You don't question them. You just take them for granted. And like you, you think some genius at some point discovered it. And this is it, like to really make our lives hell, right? And we need to learn how to, you know, calculate and compute that sort of thing, which is completely far from what math actually teaches and what math actually is. And math is actually is all about um, teaching you how to think, right? How do you think better? How do you think more uh, critically? Uh, how do you think more creatively? Um, problem solving skills. And I would actually go as far as telling you, uh, saying that math teaches compassion because you actually learn how to view problems from so many different angles um, and from different points of views and perspectives. And that actually makes you um, more compassionate as a person. So, you know, so math is just not, not even beyond, like not even just only for a book, you know, uh, is a tool that you need for STEM fields, right? It, it is needed for everyone because it really is about thinking. Um, and of course, like as we are reimagining, you know, how um, it should be taught, um, we are incorporating kind of a lot of contextual elements to it. Uh, so this book that I'm, um, that I'm, uh, that we're writing is the, um, is the one for adults, right? So the, these are for grownups, um, who want to brush up on their skills and relearn math, you know, the, the, the right way if they weren't successful, um, to begin with. And, um, a lot of it is just kind of incorporating the knowledge they already have, um, and in, including the contextual knowledge, like history behind, uh, behind things um, and you know how do you apply it in real world and philosophical aspects of it and that sort of thing um, and also um, the kind of presentation style is the story like using a lot of storytelling elements um, which has always uh, you know he tasked me with that right like he was always like you you know um, um, it's your job to, to, to nail the story storytelling part so I've been really like what's been challenging is um, context part, like I do a lot of research, right, about like historical context um, and, you know, relating things to current events and that sort of thing. For instance, like when I was um, um, writing the, um, the chapter about exponential growth, 
right? Like the pandemic hit and like that instantly is the best example, right? Like how the virus grows exponentially, um, that sort of thing. So just relating things to current events, um, that, that does require a lot of research and, um, um, and kind of digging into the different cultural aspects of things. When I do historical kind of research, one challenge has been actually, I definitely, I really, really want to incorporate um, figures from history, especially women mathematicians. Right. And mathematicians from different parts of the world. For instance, um, you know, when I was in Uzbekistan, um, I, I went to, I made it to, to Hiva to like, especially to learn more about Al Harazmi and, you know, how, um, you know, he, he really founded algebra. Right. So, and most people, especially in the Western world, they do not know that they don't, don't even know how the world algebra actually is. Um, you know, kind of a different uh, pronunciation of algorithmy, uh, Al Harazmi algorithmy and algebra is uh, algebra. Um, so it, it's challenging because history just completely omitted, especially Western history, recorded history have omitted a lot of the historical thing. And, you know, they, they, of course, there have been a lot of geniuses, women mathematicians, right? But it's hard to find stories, their stories. Um, that sort of thing. And then just making it more diverse, like including, um, you know, historical figures from, from different parts of the world, from the Arabic world, from India, from, from China, Asia, and, and so on. Um, uh, so that, that, yeah, that is one, you know, part of the challenge, um, content and storytelling, uh, part, of course. Um, I take a lot of inspiration. My grandfather, my mom's dad was, um, a, a um, a renowned, uh, was a very popular writer and poet, uh, Polat Moman in Uzbekistan. So I take a lot of inspiration from his work um, when I'm kind of, you know, thinking about storytelling and writing and that sort of thing. But all of that, a lot of that has been new to me. I mean, I have been growing, I've grown up as, you know, a daughter of a mathematician. Uh, yeah. So he, you know, he has taught me math, you know, you know, as I was growing up. But um, also kind of relating that knowledge in, to an American public also, um, right? And uh, modernizing, modernizing it and um, stitching in, you know, kind of figuring out what is the best way to tell stories. That, um, that has been challenging, but I have to say it's been a whole lot of fun as well. Oh, wow. I never heard anyone talk about math this passionately. <laughs> Definitely let me know once the book is released because I do need to relearn math. Uh, I agree with you, you know, that, you know, math is seen as something that, at least for the most part, people do not really like or have a positive attitude towards. But the way you described it, how like, actually understanding it and not just looking at it as a formula you're forced to learn would definitely change at least my perspective on that so that is amazing and um i know you mentioned that you know you can write a book anywhere and when you were a little girl you wanted to go to new york city so was us the country where your um basically life abroad started and why did you choose the us if that's the country you chose yeah, um, so US was my, um, was my first country, uh, was my, yeah, first, um, you know, home after home. Um, so like I said, I think maybe it was like when I was 11 or 12, I decided I just wanted to escape. I wanted to, um, escape with Pakistan and go, you know, live in the US. Um, partially, probably, um, it was in, um, kind of influenced from my uncles, a couple of my uncles were in the U.S. already with their families, and with one of my cousins, we would exchange letters, right, like actual written down letters, um, you know, back and forth, and she would describe what school is like there, what life is like there, you know, what her friends are like, she would send me pictures, and that sort of thing, so that was just really sparked my interest. But also as I was getting older, I think it was just a realization that one, um, I probably never actually completely fit in into the Uzbek culture. And especially as I was growing up, I got more and more annoyed about how women, um, the role of women in the society, right? That, that women are just really expected to um, grow up and, you know, get married and bear children and, you know, really look after their families and, you know, that sort of thing. And that was as far as, you know, that, that was great if you could do that that's your role sort of thing which i started ch you know challenging that and um why why is it that like that why not you know uh can't we contribute to society in some other ways in additional ways and that sort of thing uh so that was just one part of it uh and just in general uh kind of questioning the norms of the society um i um 
they're like, yeah, just a lot of other societal norms as well. Uh, the other part was it uh, was actually education, the state of education. So uh, after Soviet Union collapsed, um, my realization was that the uh, overall the quality of education has been deteriorating, um, and I wanted to go somewhere where I could um, I could uh, learn faster um, and um, you know uh, more productively and that sort of thing. So I decided to pursue my education in the U.S. I talked to my dad first. I think he was completely supportive, and by that time we had been learning English, and I was tutoring, and you know we were writing a book and that sort of thing. Then we approached my mom. Uh, initially, she was just completely surprised. Um, but, and of course, in, especially in Uzbek society, right? Yeah. Like sending your 17 year old daughter on her own to the US, um, it was something that's just kind of unfathomable. Like, uh, a lot of our family, like a lot of aunts, you know, um, uh, and, uh, family, uh, like relatives and so on, they would come to my mom and they would ask her, are you sure about this? Right? Why are you sending her? sort of a thing, but I am incredibly grateful for my parents. They have been extremely supportive um, and they've inspired me to actually dream big and pursue uh, pursue my dreams. Um, and they actually have been extremely brave, I feel like now looking back, that they've been super brave to, to let me go. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I applied it. One, one restriction they did put on me was that though, um, I could only go um, to some place where they knew someone in in the u.s right so yeah my dad's former student uh former phd student was in um was in knoxville uh, you know getting her second phd um at the university of tennessee so that's how i ended up at the university of tennessee so i did could, did not have other choices <laughs> so i had one one school choice and um one uh, city choice essentially but at that point I was extremely happy, right? So, and initially it was it was a great decision um, for my parents because she could initially let me, um, you know, help me get settled, and you know, it was just that support system, someone familiar, right, um, from Uzbekistan, um, to whom I could talk to and that sort of thing initially until I became completely independent. Oh wow! I'm sure your parents were super happy and proud of you with the decision they made to let you go because you know the achievements you made are really, really great. So, uh, talking about you know moving to the U.S., what was your some of your initial fears? Was there anything that you thought would be you know difficult in a different country? What were some of the fears you had, if there were any? And once you came to the country, how did you deal with those fears? Did you were they did, did they end up being true, or you know was it not difficult at all? Interesting. Um, fears. I think I was too young, honestly, to have any fears. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was just this thrill of I studied really hard, um, you know, to, to prepare for a TOEFL exam, right? Like back in Uzbekistan. Yeah. And you need to realize this is like 1998, 1999, back when we did not have Internet. Yeah. Right, we had the computer, but like we would actually to do email exchanges. I would go to my other uncle's house, where you know my dad's other students would help me connect to the dial-up, right, connection to internet. And the first time I actually saw Yahoo was I was amazed, right. So it's just like the best thing ever, um, yeah. connection to internet. Um, but no, like learning English that way was really hard. The only so I would go to um, the libraries, the U.S library um uh, i think it was in chorsu uh and um there was a british council library there so i would just study from books and from cassette tapes to prepare for uh for for TOEFL. so learning english part was actually very challenging and i guess my fear maybe it was not really a fear but just i mm -hmm. i knew i wanted to Kind of like spoke my spoken English was not great, right? Mm -hmm. So I, uh, my written English was great, um, and uh, my understanding was getting better, um, and uh, my TOEFL scores were great. But you know, just it, it's one thing to actually theoretically learn the language, and then another thing to actually um, to to um, to practice it, right? So uh, when I landed in Tennessee, um, of course, I, I had no idea that there version of English, like how they speak English was actually different, right? Like there's Southern accent, they do stretch things a lot. <laughs> and, um, and they're just basically their way of speaking is a bit different. So that was just, um, it was a shock uh, initially, 
Uh, it took me a bit to kind of get a hang of it and, you know, uh, start understanding things. But um, that was just one one thing. Like I realized um, it was not really a fear, but I under I knew this would be a challenge yeah. going in. Yeah. Um, so I think like the language part was the biggest one. And of course, just like getting into incorporated into the culture. Um, and I, I was so determined that I needed to succeed. So I, um, probably bit, uh, a lot more than I, uh, could chew, but I actually am glad I did that because I took on very challenging classes. I mean, uh, every, even from the very first semester, mm -hmm. um, yeah, at the UT, um, uh, and, um, I, I had to study really hard. I would just wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning and I would go to bed at 2 a.m., right? So like I would just, I would sleep four hours a day. I probably did that for several years. Um, but I was just really determined that, you know, my, my parents did support me and I owe it to them and I owe it to myself because this had been my dream for such a long time that I needed to succeed. Um, and I, I enjoyed it as well. Sorry, I probably kind of drew you from the your original question. Can you? No, can you're you... completely fine. This is so interesting. Everything you're saying is just exactly what we want to hear. You know, you had such an interesting journey. So everything you're saying really is important okay. for us to hear. And, you know, so you came to the U.S., you went to school. Then um, I know a lot of people, I mean, at least for me, you're one of the, you're the only person I know that has worked uh, for LinkedIn. So that is a very interesting, you know, thing for me to hear about your experience there. So could you talk a little bit about um, how you started at LinkedIn and how your experience was there in general? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but... All good. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so LinkedIn, I, um, I think so that very, uh, after the very first, uh, the very first, uh, kind of, um, professional experience I had at, uh, in, in Austin and National Instruments where I got recruited, um, by a former student. After that, all of my, uh, next jobs have been through LinkedIn, right? So I would always get, find my job on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, I found, uh, my LinkedIn gig through LinkedIn as well. So they recruited me, um, for a role. Um, initially this was, I was in the search and discovery area. Um, so it was a product lead for search and discovery, um, and did that for a year and a half or so. And then, um, became a head of product for the identity product. Um, after that, so it's more of a generalist um, a role and uh, as a leadership role. Um, experience has been incredibly amazing. Um, I I love the company. Um, it's uh, people are extremely bright and but uh, also very kind and compassionate. Uh, mm -hmm. A very mature organization and. Um, so a lot of times, really, it's the people who really make it, make or break the company. And I can truly say that LinkedIn has, um, you know, some of the most amazing people in Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, I learned a ton. Uh, of course, um, overall, LinkedIn is a very data-driven company. Mm -hmm. um, at the heart of LinkedIn products is this um, uh, is the economic graph, what they call it, like uh, economic graph, which is the representation of the world's economy, right? So like every, you know, member you have in the economy, every job, every company, every job offered with it by those companies um, and academic institutions, all the knowledge they share, um, all of that is, um, is represented in this knowledge graph, in this uh, economic graph. Um, and of course, that's a ton of data. So you need to process and analyze all that data. So um, I tapped into that and that was um, very, very interesting uh, for me, especially coming from data background. Um, and professionally, I grew a lot for sure. And I probably one of the biggest reasons, which, which I knew, but like something that really kind of really strengthened um, my belief that networking is so important, right? So LinkedIn is just really built on the whole premise of, premise of like how human connection and networking is incredibly important, especially, um, of course it is important, super important for, uh, for social context, but this is um, kind of uh, in the professional context, right? Um, you never know where your next opportunity is gonna come from. And it doesn't have to be in the form of a job. It could be just, you know, article that you share, uh, yeah. right? Um, or you read. Uh, or someone you, you get connected now, maybe two years down the road, they will have an opportunity for you, 
right? Um, could be like speaking engagements, could be, you know, mentoring opportunities or volunteering or like actual jobs and that sort of thing. And the power of networking. Um, so that like LinkedIn really taught me that, um, right? Like how uh, it is important um, and um, how, you know, all opportunities are tied to it. Wow. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, obviously getting into LinkedIn is not easy. It's so very competitive, I could tell, I'm sure. So what would you say are some skills that maybe helped you get into LinkedIn or some skill in general that you think are so important in today's professional world? Yeah, so I think it really depends. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about in tech. Um, uh, LinkedIn is not an exception, but just in, gen in general in tech, I would say. It also actually depends on which role you're pursuing, yeah. right? Like whether you're a software engineer or a designer or a product manager or a marketing specialist. So um, there's that types of skills uh, that you would need uh, kind of vary. But there are, of course, the base skills, right? So just in general, kind of the four C's, I believe, that are um, the, like a lot of the soft skills, uh, actually. So creativity, uh, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. So those are, you know, it, it's it's not like it's not easy. You can't just like pick it up and learn. You know, yeah. uh, it will take years, of course, and a lot of you know kind of maturity. Um, but I would say these are the four skills that are at the backbone um, mm -hmm. of you know uh, of making you a a great professional. Um, apart from that, so I, I can talk to product management, right? Since that, uh, that's my field, just like uh, in terms of hard skills. Um, so a lot of it is just there's the um, product vision and strategy kind of product sense sort of skills. Um, there's a lot of communication and product management. So uh, that definitely translates. Um, and then there's just technical skills that you would need to master. As a product manager, you don't have to sit down and write code all day long, but some background um, in, in technical fields such as computer science or math uh, or physics and that sort of thing could actually help out a lot. Uh, so technical skills, kind of understanding how engineering systems are built and architected and um, you know how basic algorithms work, that sort of thing is super important. Um, uh, and analytical skills are extremely important for a product manager. So a lot of data science, data, um, you know, sifting through the data, analyzing data, just really having an analytic mindset uh, when you're approaching approaching problems. Um, it is extremely important. Operational um, uh, kind of excellence is important as well. How do you work with others? You know, as a product manager, you actually sit at the intersection of engineering, um, data science, UX design, uh, marketing, business, and so on, right? So many different fields. You're at the intersection of them and you collaborate with every one of these types of individuals um, as you're building the product. So you need to know how to speak their language, right? At least you need to be able to understand them and you need to be able to sound credible. So it's kind of like I, t I say, you know, they say like master, um, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. I actually think as a product manager, you need to be jack of all trades, master of some. So that's why I like some sort of background in one of one or many of those fields um, that will be super important. So yeah, uh, data um, um, is uh, really important as well. So I think those are the major ones. Um, and yeah, I think LinkedIn is no exception. Uh, it's just different companies have their different kind of cultures as well. LinkedIn t tends to be very, um, very focused on data um, because it's just the nature you know, of the product, uh, it is built up, uh, built on top of this massive amount of data. Uh, so you need to be able to analyze it to make sense of it, to build mm -hmm. products, to be able to build products on top of it to make uh, business, right? So to monetize them and that sort of thing. So I, I would say for LinkedIn uh, specifically, being comfortable with data is very important. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sure that was super helpful for everyone to hear, especially our audience in the tech industry. So thank you for sharing um, about that. So now I know you had a very interesting travel journey. You know, you've been all over the world. So definitely want to spend some time talking about that. Could you uh, maybe briefly describe how your interest in traveling just, you know, occurred? Like, how did you become interested in this? Or has this always been your goal? And then kind of um, you could talk about which country Country, countries you visited and why you chose those countries specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interest in travel, I think it's always been there. Just I think I've always wanted to explore um, and just 
explore um, you know you know, different you know parts of the you know different parts of the uh, globe I guess yeah. um, but also just kind of from ide ideology perspective as well kind of explore you know the information mm -hmm. and knowledge and i guess all that kind of stuff that's like that's how my interest in you know social discovery kind of comes from but you know exploration has always been kind of ingrained in me i think just i've been you know from childhood i've been very curious yeah. And actually, one of my favorite books is Alice in Wonderland. And uh, I've always been, you know, just like to this day, you know, I actually reread it like 100 times all the oh. time. And it's like a lot of just like exploring the Wonderland sort mm -hmm. of, you know, concepts, right? And also Little Prince, you know, kind of similar ideas. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I was like a little kid, I would actually leave my window open at night hoping and praying that aliens would come get me so and they would just like you know you know you know we would travel the world together kind of a thing so i think it started early and of course i wanted to come to the u.s so that was my first travel experience well like before that we would vacation at the black sea um and so you know um that's what kind of vacation sort of uh, things but like that actually in georgia right like uh, Gruzia and Abkhazia, Ap like those areas that actually they have very um, rich cultures as well. So yeah. when I was a kid, I actually kind of was fascinated by that. Um, but yeah, beyond U.S., so in the U.S., I actually moved around to different you know parts of the U.S. as well. Initially in Knoxville, and then in in Austin, and then in California, and all of these U.S. is that is huge, right? And different states actually, different parts of the U.S. they have their own kind of different flavors of cultures and um, uh, worldviews and that sort of thing. So that was really cool to kind of every time I would just actually move. Um, and start over, right? Like without without knowing anyone, pretty much um, in the new new area. So it was, it felt like I was actually moving to a different country, almost. Um, and then I traveled throughout, um, you know, um, over, uh, you know, as I was, you know, settled in the U.S. just for vacations and that sort of thing. But I always wanted to actually, I was like starting to get an itch for starting anew again. Right, yeah. like going somewhere where you don't know the language, where you don't know the culture, um, everything is so foreign. And for for some people, this is just a horrible nightmare, right? Yeah. For me, this is such a fascinating thing because I want to, I, I want to like understand how these people live, right? Yeah. So I want to actually try to become one of them or at least pretend sort of thing. So yeah, when I took my sabbatical, I, I decided I, this is the time for me to travel. And I'm super thankful that I did that last year, not this year. Um, but uh, yeah, I went back to Uzbekistan first. And then uh, from there, I joined this uh, organization called um, Remote Year. And what they do is they organize trips for um, for individuals, usually professionals, and from different you know parts of the world, from different disciplines, and so on. So you get together with a bunch of people, like like-minded people who love traveling, and yeah. who want to be able to you know who want to work from abroad, right? So they you call like they're called digital nomads, but you know I, I don't really like that term so much. Yeah. But kind of location independent workers essentially. Um, so we were actually a uh, fifty people. Uh, traveling the world together. So the, this program, a remote year, organizes trips and they give you an itinerary. Every month we're in different city in different country. Uh, so I did that for four months. So initially it was in Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, the next month after that we were in Marrakesh um, in Morocco. The next one was in Lisbon in Portugal. And then the next was in uh, Valencia, Spain. Um, and then after that, I continued on my own because I loved it so much. So I went to Berlin after that, Kyoto, Japan after that, um, Bali after that, uh, let's see, briefly Kuala Lumpur, and then went back to Uzbekistan for a bit. And then I had a speaking engagement in Belgrade um, in, in Serbia. So went there, hold on, let me, there's some sort of a thing that's just a second. Okay, um, like, sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so that was in Belgrade after that, and then explored like um, Budapest, Hungary for a bit, Vienna, Austria. Uh, and then I lived, I've always wanted to live in Paris. Um, I've been learning um, French since college, 
and just, just on my own uh, learning. I'm fascinated with French culture, you know, music, uh, films, and cinema, and so on. So um, I've been to Paris many times, but this time I actually wanted to feel like I lived there. And yeah. uh, so I was in Paris for a month after that in London, um, and then Iceland. Iceland, I've you know, it's just so close to my heart. Um, the natural beauty of it all is just so fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. It feels like it's not Earth anymore. And also Scandinavian culture has always been super fascinating for me as well. Um, so I got to actually, I felt like I actually lived there this time around and uh, in Reykjavik. Uh, it was incredible. Um, and then I had never been to Latin America, so I wanted to check it out. So we went to Peru. We joined my travel group uh, at that time, and we went to Peru and traveled across Lima and Cusco, Cusco um, and other areas. I have to say, I'm jealous. <laughs> that is amazing. That is awesome. So out of all the countries you've been in, which ones did you like the most? Is there anything specific that really stood out to you about that country? Why it kind of, you know, stayed in your mind and you just have a preference for it? I think like um, they are all amazing and so special in so many different regards, right? And um, if you would ask me where I would live, for instance, uh, I would no doubt I would say Lisbon in Portugal. Now, this was my first time in Portugal and just I fell in love with the city and just natural beauty is just incredibly beautiful and actually also reminded me of San Francisco a lot, like of uh, the Bay Area, uh, but way better, <laughs> right? So like... Uh, so nature is all accessible there are, you know the, the beaches um the you know just like uh, everything you need uh, is there the climate is very mild um and it's just culturally it's so rich as well i got you know i explored the music there and uh, you know the museums and everything and what really stood out to me was the people people are just incredibly humble and friendly and nice yeah. um especially compared to the other parts of you know europe they don't actually have any um not much ego at all right so everyone is just um is willing to really help you out and go out of their way to do anything for you so i would say lisbon portugal would be my first choice Paris has always been near and dear to my heart. So I would say, you know, Paris after that. Um, and then, uh, let's see, um, Reykjavik, Iceland is just, it's just beautiful. Again, um, I would say the same thing about the people there. Extremely humble, uh, extremely friendly and nice and very smart, um, people there as well. Yeah, no, I definitely want to go to Iceland as well. I've heard great things about it, as well as all other countries that you've listed. So, um, wow, my, I'm blanking on my question. Okay, let me just move on. Let me see. So was there any Uzbek diaspora in any of those countries that you've been in? Um, or were you more focused on the travel aspect of it? Um, yeah, so when I first arrived, so in the U.S., right, in Knoxville, I don't think there was, like, there's not, basically none, right? Yeah. So at that time, I, I, like, the only people I knew in the U.S., they were, in general, in the U.S., um, who would, who came there for education were um, the um, folks who had the Umid scholarship mm -hmm. uh, and also through Axel, I believe. Uh, but all of them like would come in and would go back to Uzbekistan, right? Because that was a requirement. Yeah. I had I did not know anyone who actually came uh, to study on their own, uh, mm -hmm. and especially in Knoxville, be beyond my father's former student, um, right? Like who, uh, with whom my parents trusted me, uh, and her family, uh, I did not have any any. I did not know anyone from Uzbekistan at that time, at that time. I think through college um, at my university there were a couple of uh, Russian speaking people from the former um, USSR. Um, but yeah, there was basically no Uzbek diaspora in Tennessee. Um, and then in Austin, very similar story, I think, actually. There were maybe a couple of families there. Um, but apart from that, that, certainly not in my professional experience. I had never met anyone from Uzbekistan, um, whether ethnically Uzbek or not, right? So, um, and also, uh, for everyone's different, right? So for, for me, especially, it was actually one part of the thing um, where um, it was actually kind of a catalyst for me to get into integrated into the new culture yeah. faster because I did not have that comfort zone and I did not have that kind of 
space where I would just avoid reality, right? And just like hang out with my Uzbek friends and, you know, eat Ash and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I had to actually start making friends, local friends, you know, American friends really fast and learn the culture that way. And actually that's what I wanted. So it actually worked out that way. Um, I, but I d would not discount at all the importance of Uzbek diaspora anywhere you go, right? That can be, especially your initial community, that can be super, super important. But um, in the US then actually, like my sister came and joined me after a couple of years and then my brother came and, came and joined me after several years after that. So my I, I had my family. Um, so that was my Uzbek diaspora. Um, and when I travel um, at this point, I think uh, I do, I do not, um, I, I was only traveling for like a month, right, in every yeah. place. So um, it was hard to, you know, kind of find, uh, I think in one place in London through, through a family, um, I did actually, um, uh, I, I, I did hang out with uh, this Uzbek girl. Um, it was amazing. And then um, I did kind of find a few uh, expats. Usually when I say like, I'm going somewhere, some friends will tell me, I have a friend, right? Like you should reach out to her or him, that sort of thing. So I did uh, kind of, uh, I did get got in, get in touch with expat communities, um, you know, for Americans and you know, English speaking people basically. And that was just incredible because they could, could give me tips um, what should I, I should do. And we could compare cultures, right? That sort of thing. And we'd have actually really meaningful discussions and conversations. Uh, so that was great. So yeah, no, thank you so much for uh, sharing about that. And as someone who has traveled, um, the world basically you know i feel like everybody wants to travel but nobody gets to it so what are some maybe recommendations some tips tricks words of encouragement you have for people to start traveling to really ex explore the world yeah like i said it's it's not for everyone but people who say who want to do it it actually they, they think it's so hard to pull it off and it is not Right. So obviously, when if it's safe, you know, in terms of like right now, it's the pandemic and definitely this is not the right time. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, countries are not expecting other you know nationals anyways, a lot of the countries. But, you know, assuming the pandemic is over and it's safe to travel again, um, my tips would be. So for me, what I've done is I actually like got rid of most of my belong, maybe like 80 percent of my things um and uh just really boil it down to essential right what do i actually need and boiled all of that down into one suitcase so mm -hmm. i have one large suitcase and one backpack and that basically for like a year and a half or so um when i traveled that essentially was my home and that was more than enough right like mm -hmm. you think you need a lot more things that, than you actually do and if you need things you can always buy them and, you know, wherever, you know, you're traveling as well, you, they do sell things there. And most of the times it actually is cheaper and better. And you get, you know, you get to keep them as souvenirs and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I think traveling light is, you know, I cannot overemphasize that. Um, I think that can actually make things a lot simpler for people. And also just keeping an open mind, uh, you know, everything will be different. You know, you need to actually do some pre-planning in terms of understand what the currency um, they use there and how do you get your SIM card initially, right? Yeah. Like those kinds of like Wi-Fi is so crucial. So you need to like pre-plan things like just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, after a while, it just becomes kind of, you know, second nature. But um, initial research is super important. Um, but uh, let's see. Yeah. Apart from that, just having an open mind and like being ready to embrace different cultures yeah. and actually, you know, being not being shy about just you know talking to strangers. Right. Um, of course, like you, you don't want to do that, like in a dark alley at 3 a.m. in the morning. But, you know, like, you know, just use your best judgment, essentially. And um, you would be surprised how kind people are, uh, yeah. especially people are in the world are super receptive into, especially when I say I am from Uzbekistan originally, everyone, like just the eyes light up, right? Because they've never met anyone yeah. from Uzbekistan before. Yeah. They've kind of vaguely heard about the country. They know it's kind of part of the former, you know, Soviet Union. But apart from that, they just don't know much about, you know, anything. So they ask me all about the history, what people are like, what's the cuisine like, all that stuff. So that's like an instant kind of conversation starter as yeah. well. 
Um, yeah, so I, I actually do have a travel blog um, so that I started, but I need to keep it up. Uh, but it's called Shaheen Wonderland. So if, if folks want to check it out, like I try, I'm trying to kind of compare everything that I learned, you know, mm -hmm. cultures, uh, you know, how people think, um, how they live, and what are the challenges in different countries and, you know, societies and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there as well. Did you say Shaheen or Shaheena? Sh Shaheen, S H A. H I N mm -hmm. Wonderland. Wonderland. Just like Alice in Wonderland. I'll check it out. Awesome. Like, yeah. That's amazing. Definitely we'll check it out. Uh, so, you know, as Uzbeks will have very specific cultural values, traditions, just characteristics, you know. What would you say were some characteristics that you maybe had to adjust when you were traveling around the world or some characteristics that really helped you um, even, you know, like, do a better job in a different country maybe or adjust faster? Like, is there anything you could say about our specific cultural values in other countries? Interesting. So I think like one cultural value um, that I really like, uh, kind, kind of cultural thing that I really value about Uzbekistan, and I actually have gotten to appreciate it as I've gotten older, is how networking is actually ingrained into the society, right? So initially I would get really frustrated about like, how can I talk to someone and like, half an hour they spend on small talk, right? Yeah. Just like asking about how I am, how my parents are, how my like family, like how much my work, all that kind of stuff. But then I realized this is actually the investment they make into creating their communities and networking, right? So then, you know, uh, that creates kind of a bond and connection with people. And later on people, you know, when people are in need, they will help each other out because they already have that kind of connection established. Um, so networking, uh, essentially just being open to and like talking to the people, yeah. um, that sort of thing, I, I, I uh, definitely try to keep with me. I think another cultural value um, in um, kind of ingrained into Uzbeks is hospitality, right? So it's just how hospital people, hospitable people are and just how receptive they are to guests. And they go out of their way to make their guests comfortable. Sure. So that's something I try to adhere to and just be mindful of like when I'm hosting people, like being mindful about like what their preferences are and that sort of thing. Um, some things I would adjust that I like I, I adjusted or maybe like some things that kind of pushed me out of the culture in the first place mm -hmm. is just uh, one of it is just more kind of open mindedness, right? Like being more open minded. So like a lot of the things are dictated by parents and by the society in you know, Uzbek cultures. Yeah. Um so like you're supposed to do X by this time, Y by this time, like you need to get do you know, just like a progression of steps and you're not supposed to deviate from them. Right, and especially they're strict for, towards women and girls, um, as well in terms of like uh, societal norms and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it's just kind of going beyond that, and you know, letting people have their own freedom of choice um, and freedom of expression, and you know, decide for themselves. Like parents can uh, actually be extremely helpful in advising things. Right. And their their heart is coming from the right place, right? They they have the best intentions, yeah. but also they do not know what's best for the current time for the child, for instance. Yeah. Um, so, like for for kids, I think it's just basically taking what you you know as a consideration, as a serious consideration. But other things you can decide on, um, you know, lifestyle choices. You know, for instance, you want to make where you want to live, where how you want to live, and all that stuff. Um, you get to decide for yourself and just having that open mind, I think, um, is super important, especially when you're traveling. Yeah. And uh, something that ha has actually been, you know, appreciating, you know, the diversity of cultures and the ways of living and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, for, for me, I think that's just been one of the strongest, you know, attitudes um and uh perspectives i think um that helped me really get integrated into the new cultures as i traveled yeah yeah absolutely wow we got so carried away with your amazing interesting stories i didn't even realize we're on top of the hour uh, if you do have a few minutes uh, i would love to you know trans uh, transition into q a um i hope you do have some time yeah okay so yeah, everyone uh -huh. uh, feel free to drop your questions i'm gonna uh quickly go through some comments that i got while you were talking i really want to make sure that you hear about them because you know everybody's appreciating what an amazing person you are you know people said great 
great advice and somebody was impressed that you used to sleep for like four or five hours, three hours actually, uh, while you were, you know, when you first moved and you were working hard studying and, you know, working towards your goals. And um, Sarvar said, impressive, there are no, not many people who can sacrifice their 18 or 20 hours a day to achieve their goals. So, you know, obviously everybody's super, super, just impressed by your accomplishments. So we are going to open it up to questions. As I said, I will start pulling them up on the screen uh, so we can go one by one. So everyone feel free to drop your questions. Just make sure they're around Shahina's experiences abroad, uh, Uzbek diaspora experiences abroad or her expertise of business. So relevant questions. So we have a question from Shirzad Golamov. He is asking, I read that you love math, writing a textbook. What would you suggest for someone who loves studying math but hasn't done so since high school? Where do you start again to learn math for fun? Uh, you wait for my book to finish. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, but in all seriousness, there's so many amazing resources um, online. Um, there are a lot. There are several YouTube channels. There's one I really like. It's um, it's called Three Blue One Brown. Uh, that's a great resource. There's Math Math Logger. I believe that one math professor um, from somewhere in Europe he hosts a blog. There's so many uh, basic amazing blogs. A podcast that I really like, not specifically about math, but actually a lot kind of uh, um, uh, subjects around it by a math professor. It's called Joy, Joy of X. Um, it's great. There's also a, uh, a, a kind of online education tool called brilliance.org. Once in a while, I use that. It's kind of like puzzle sort of, you know, kind of questions that you can answer. Um, and just overall, kind of, there's so many books uh, about like the history of math as well um, that are great. Um, the, the professor who um, who actually hosts the Joy of X, he has written a book called Joy of X as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that's great. But just a, a lot of it all, honestly, like math is in everything, really, right? Like you don't actually need to pick up a math book um, to to study math. So it's just being more curious about, you know, quantitative aspects of things or like things that have like sh shapes and figures. For instance, when I was in Samarkand and Tiba, right, like, like the architecture is just so stunning and like all geometric, right? So like Muslim architecture. So it's just like analyzing the shapes and appreciating them and like figuring out like how they are kind of, kind of composed and that sort of thing. So it's just like, I, I would say paying attention. Um, and a huge thing these days is like information, misinformation, logic, right? Like people seem to kind of have forgotten so many kind of fundamental things about logic, which is, which breaks my heart. But um, again, kind of stresses the fact that we definitely need better math education mm -hmm. um, in the current society. But just being mindful of, you know, like just in politics, for instance, right? What kind of logic are they using? You know, uh, there are different kinds of logics, of course, and how, what kind of logic are, are, are different societies are using? Um, and if you want to study up, then like you can always find resources online. I spent like maybe half of my time on Wikipedia, honestly. It's not a great tool to learn, mm -hmm. but it's a great tool to research and find resources from as well. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you so much. That was a great, very complete answer. So we have another question from Big South Kabila. What do you think are three most important skills everyone should have when they are moving to a foreign country? Hmm. Yeah. Skills, interesting life I skills. I think about this one too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really great question, um, Big South. Um, it, so I think open-mindedness is, is, is crucial. And just be being ready to uh, to learn about new cultures and keeping you open mind is incredibly important. Curiosity, um, curiosity to explore, curiosity to kind of uh, understand and trying things. Uh, for instance, when I travel, I always try all kinds of cultural activities. I go listen to their music, right? Attend concerts, live music, and so on. Go to watch their theater and you know films and. Um, whatnot, and it's just like really immersing yourself um, in, in into those kind of cu cultural aspects of things, uh, and that I think stems from curiosity and kind of the need for exploration. Um, adaptability, I think, is important. Um, you know, if you are very rigid and uh, you just are very stuck in your own ways, you might have a hard time 
adapting into the new culture. You don't have to just completely assimilate. You can always, you, you can and you should always be yourself. Right, yeah. like, and you should stay true to yourself, but also understanding how cultural norms are, and like in which ways you can adapt to to those cultures um, is it, just a smart way of surviving and thriving. I would say. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. And we have another uh, and language. You have to learn the language. I think, like, just overall, yeah. Definitely. So we have a few more questions coming in. So we have a question from Jahangir. Let me pull it up. Sorry if I missed earlier, but your LinkedIn says you're doing a sabbatical. Could you tell more about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I took a sabbatical to focus on um, writing a book, um, a mathematics book. Um, this one is for adults. Um, to uh, as a refresher, to re-educate them on um, on math that they can actually use, um, and really to teach them how to think better, uh, which is an absolutely crucial skill for all of humanity. So I've been working on that, um, and uh, and also like we we were talking about, I've been traveling around the world right now. I'm back in San Francisco. But uh, I, yeah, it's just like it actually this whole travel experience opened up my eyes into the whole like I work from anywhere philosophy, right? So I saw all of these, like I, we, uh, the, the travel group I was part of, they would organize uh, co-working spaces for us. And, uh, you know, just, uh, my, my group, uh, most of the people were just, they actually had their day jobs. They just worked remotely, right? Like some of them were entrepreneurs, some are, you know, designers, some are engineers, some are, um, you know, photographers and so on. But all of us would go to co-working spaces and work from there. And it was just such an amazing thing. The whole flexibility gives you to yeah. work remotely. I, I understand not everyone can, but a lot of, you know, professional professions right now, they just can be, you know, done remotely, and a, a lot of the jobs can be done remotely, and it's just such, um, uh, it gives you, like, extra sense of independence um, yeah. and flexibility, which can be uh, super crucial. For sure. So then we also have a question that is asking, very inspirational story, so what do you suggest for young girls from Uzbekistan? What do you think uh, one word that would be key factor to achieve the goal? So basically your advice for girls in Uzbekistan to be successful. Um, it's hard to give advice to anyone because everyone ha has different yeah. situations and contexts. Yeah. Uh, so like it, I, I kind of hesitate to give like blanket kind of advice, um, but I guess like I kind, kind of can reframe it and uh, say like what kind of advice I would give myself, right? Like when I was younger, when I was back there in Uzbekistan, for instance, I think just first of all, uh, since this question is specifically about girls, just overall disregard all the societal, kind of what society is telling you about the role of women in the society, right? Um, uh, the whole sense of patriarchy is super strong, unfortunately still in Uzbekistan. Um, and I, I think, you know, we need to teach girls to actually, you know, think beyond that. Uh, yeah. This is not, you're not, you know, you, you don't have to follow this path. This is not the only path for you. You are incredibly smart. Um, you're, you're resilient, right? You, uh, you're incredibly creative um, and you can do so many things, whatever you set your mind to. So I would say, at least to myself, right, dream big. I like you know it's just the thing is if you do not dream big then you just you know do everything possible to achieve that you know kind of already low kind of expectation um and you don't you won't really you know make progress but the, the higher your dreams are the more the more like the more kind of audacious your dreams are you have so much so many opportunities to actually do amazing things um so dreaming big would be one um another one would be just working hard um, so I, I do kind of caveat that though, like working hard by itself is not, um, is not the right, uh, I think, um, the right thing to do. Uh, I think especially, um, late, uh, as I've been realizing lately, American society just overvalues grit, right? Overvalues just busyness and just yeah. kind of appearance of working hard, um, even though you might not be actually productive. And that's actually not good. This is really not yeah. good for your mind, for your body, for anything really, right? Like for your happiness, certainly it's not. Um, but so I say work hard to pursue your dreams, but also kind of, they, they say work smart, but like not just good, but wit is also yeah. important. 
and just really be kind to yourself be kind to your body be kind to your mind um and appreciate how far you've come um yes you you have big dreams and you want to work hard to achieve them but um you uh you need to be kind to yourself and yeah you know and um appreciate appreciate the things um and take things one step at a time wow just gonna say i really appreciate that like every single word coming out of your mouth right now because it's really relevant even to me i personally you know ever since i moved to the u.s realized that i'm always busy you know, always busy, but what am I doing? At the end of the day, I think about what I accomplished, you know, how far I've came. And it's not as much as I would like to. It's just, you know, the appearance of being busy, as you said. And I really appreciate you highlighting that. And that's, that, that's something to really work on because it can actually push you away from your dreams rather than bring you closer. So thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Yeah, no, once in a while, I definitely suggest like taking a breather and just reevaluating, right? Yeah. Like where you are at. And um, if you're caught in this like hamster wheel, right, spinning your wheels and like you're not seeing any results, you're just wor wearing yourself off. And at this point, you need to stop and reevaluate things and, you know, start kind of making some changes. So, yeah. Absolutely. So our next question is from Nilufar. She's asking, did you travel alone? How did you stay safe traveling to foreign countries? Mm -hmm. Um, so, like I said, so initially it was in Uzbekistan, so of course, uh, no problem there. Um, and uh, I joined the travel group. Uh, so there were 50 of us, actually, all from, you know, a, a lot of them from the U.S., but uh, several people from Asia and Australia, Canada, and so on. So that was actually um, a, a great thing to do for me, like, because I did have that same concern initially as well. Um, is it safe for me to travel alone? And that actually gave me the confidence initially, right? Like all of us are traveling together. We would split up and do things together and that sort of thing. Um, but realized that actually I can totally do this on my own. Um, of course, I needed to be, you, you need to stay, you know, you, you need to be safe. You should not do questionable things, uh, right? And it's just a lot of it is using common judgment. Um, so for me, I would pre-plan. So I did travel alone after that four months. Um, I was traveling alone. I, was, I would meet up with a lot of my previous travel mates uh, in different places. I would meet up with, like, if I had any connections and that sort of thing. I would make new friends once I got there. Um, but for the most part, I would say I definitely traveled alone. Actually, later on um, in Bali, my, my mom joined me. So we traveled together for a couple of months as well. But yeah, for the most part, I was, tra I was traveling alone. How did I stay safe? safe? So pre-planning. Um, so planning, so I was mostly um, finding Airbnbs uh, and getting Airbnbs and kind of safe neighborhoods, right? So I was doing some research about like, what are the neighborhoods that are safe, especially for women who are traveling alone, that sort of thing. And uh, there are some travel blogs that give you kind of the spiel about um, what's safe and what's not, and that sort of thing as well. Um, let's see, uh, of course, like you, you have your phone with you. The, uh, I had some sort of uh, the international SOS kind of number handy if I ever needed it, right? So there are, there's help, um, you know, that you can get if you needed it. Um, and let's see, uh, health insurance, obviously, is super important, you know, when you're traveling, especially for that amount of time, you, obviously, you, you're going to get sick at some point, right? Like either it could be like food poisoning and that sort of thing, something environmental, it could be like just common cold and that sort of thing. So having a reliable health insurance um, was really important. And just hanging out with the right people, I would say. Um, and uh, for, for me specifically, I actually, um, I use Meetup a lot. A Meetup and Eventbrite events, uh, sometimes Airbnb experiences, um, to find events based on my interests. And that actually uh, was how I made friends, a lot of my friends as well, because I would just find um, local people with common interests right uh, common interest in music common interest in technology for instance you know that sort of thing and then like just basically um you have one connection that become like they drag in their other connections and just be, they expose you to their kind of diaspora and community and uh, you have your circle of friends essentially that way um and um yeah just like basically be around people who, who whom you trust um one uh, I guess, yeah, so that's what I would say. Like a lot of it, like I actually did a lot of research initially. Um, I would not probably go to Morocco all by myself. 
so that's why I traveled with a with um you know with a with a travel group, and that was super uh, you know super um, important. I think it may, might have been kind of harder for me to get by in Kyoto as well, even though it's extremely safe. But basically, no one speaks English. So if you don't have any local connections um, yeah. or you're traveling with someone. Um, it would be kind of hard to get by. So I think just doing initial research and figuring out, like Europe is extremely easy to travel yeah. alone, for instance, yeah. right? Like South America is pretty easy as well. So it just really depends too. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, just in the sake of time, how many more minutes would you like to spend on questions? Because we can go on forever. There's so many questions for you. I'm, I'm okay with a couple more. A couple more. Okay, let's spend another five, 10 minutes maybe. So what type of, so Dastan Shukurov is asking, what type of customer or consumer research do you conduct and how often if you do? Mm -hmm. So as a product manager, you do rely on a lot of research, right? Uh, user research. Um, so in bigger established, more established companies like LinkedIn, eBay, and Eventbrite, you actually do have a, a team called user, you know, user research team, user experience research team. Um, and they do um, recruit people uh, to, to and, and conduct research, basically. We would, I would give them new versions um, of the app or of the product, essentially, uh, that I want to test. And they go recruit people and they conduct interviews. Some of them I would conduct myself, but for sure all of them I would listen to and ask questions and that sort of thing so actually talking to uh to customers to, to potential customers and to users is extremely important i actually do it on my own as well really like you know just in general and more in more startups you actually don't have the luxury of having teams like that um and for entrepreneurs uh, but even beyond that even uh, if i uh, do have this kind of uh, established you know framework i do my own research all the time as well um so um, people around me, they know me, my friends and family, you know, every time I'm working on a product, they basically hear about everything, right? So because I ask about their opinion, I ask them to A-B test it, to, to beta test it. Um, and I ask, you know, just like, it could be just high level kind of questions about strategy and that sort of thing, or it could be a specific something about the design um, or product decision uh, for the feature. But um, I do talk to real people. Uh, and get their opinion as much as I can as well. Awesome, thank you. So another IT question, do you think it's worth it to learn and earn various certificates from different universities online um, courses and software development, or is it better to have a portfolio and they said the certificates cost from 70 to $200 and more? <laughs> Uh, to be honest, I'm not the best person to comment on that. Um, so especially for software development, also it depends on what kind of software development this is, like back end versus front end, more kind of consumer facing, or is this some sort of a specific kind of niche kind of like cloud product and that sort of thing. Some of them do, um, some, for some of them certificates are actually valued and uh, kind of necessary. Um, for uh, but for more generic kind of generalist software engineer, I don't think so. Like at least from my point of view, right? Um, I don't think certificates um, are necessary. Uh, actually, your experience speaks louder. I would say just showing examples of your work or GitHub projects and so on, um, or if you actually have worked for companies before, um, you know, uh, outlining your job, uh, what we, what your contribution was there. Um, even like code, coded snippet examples and that sort of thing, that actually speaks louder than you having some sort of you know, credentials and in, in, in forms of certificates, I would say. That's at least my opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. So then uh, I see another interesting question from Aris Azar. Top five books you like or suggest or top five speakers maybe from TED Talks that you would mm -hmm. like to present basically. Interesting. Okay, so top five books. I already mentioned Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. So, like, I know it's for a book for kids, but I, I think it's actually even more relevant for adults. It actually was written by a mathematician. Uh, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician. Mm -hmm. And the whole book is about math, which he masked with stories. People, no one understands, like, realizes actually? it, but it actually is a math book. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> because, like, there's a lot of logic there. And, you know, he's actually 
explaining complex analysis, like imagining your numbers, complex numbers there. Like he's just basically making fun of so many things. Wow. Um, there's just so many layers to it. Uh, another book that's kind of really near and dear to my heart is um, my dad's book uh, called Formulas of Life. I actually do keep it around with me. Hayat Formula Lara, Formula Zhizni. So it's in three languages. And this is the book that actually gets me to it. So like when he was in his 40s, I believe, um, he kind of summarized what he's learned about life right um and uh, like he has these theories and theses and principles and yeah. and then he has like 99 formulas that he came up with um but it's just for me it's just been a guiding light you know every time i get stuck in life i have questions kind of more existential questions philosophical questions that sort of thing this is the book that carries me through i love it um other books i love walter isaacson's you know, I do like learning about other uh, other figures in history. I, I like Walter Isaacson's biographies, um, the one about Leonardo da Vinci, uh, another one about Einstein. Um, so, like those books, I really admire. I love. Um, I I read a lot of physics books as well, more kind of more popular physics. Uh, there's a book called The Big Picture by Sean Carroll. He's a theoretical physicist, um, which has been really great for me. Uh, let's see. So many. The Gene uh, by Siddharth, Siddhartha Mukherjee um, is uh, an, a phenomenal book, uh, kind of, if you want to learn about bio, uh, microbiology, right, and how genes work, that sort of thing. Uh, super cool. And then uh, cool. There, there's a book I really love um, uh, by Susan Cain. People probably, some people probably all, uh, know, it's called Quiet. And it's just Power of Introverts. Right, like actually, especially growing up in Uzbekistan, everything is just like society is it's a tight knit connection, right? Like everyone seems to be in the like in each other's business. For me, every time I actually go back, I actually have a reverse culture shock um, because I need to kind of I need a few days to to get readjusted, right? Yeah. Like because everyone's asking me all the personal questions, exactly. and you know everyone's to kind of dictate what I should do, what I should not do, <laughs> all that stuff. And also, I feel like just everyone's just very social. Um, and I am an introvert. I'm a more social introvert, but I definitely consider myself as an introvert. And this book has, like, when I first read it, it was just super eye-opening, thinking, oh, there are people like me, right? And it actually is a superpower um, because you get your energy when you're alone. And I'm the most creative when I'm actually in my own head and, and I'm alone and I'm thinking about things. Yeah. So and the book is called Quiet. Um, but there's so many amazing books. Thank um, you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for those recommendations. Hopefully everyone had time to write those down. <laughs> so we actually received another question from Dastan Shikurev, uh, who is asking, how do you develop your product roadmap? What are most common mistakes product managers do during this process? Mm -hmm. I think like the most common thing is just not actually thinking about the problem. Uh, I, I would say that the number one advice I give to product managers is start with the problem, right? What is the problem? Who has it? Who like does this actually need to be solved, right? Uh, does it need to be solved right now? Um, and you know, to what extent? And all that stuff. And what are the possible solutions? What is you know, which one is better to pursue now? That sort of thing. So actually, uh, that orients you. And of course, you want to marry that with the. Uh, with the business, you know, what the business needs and what actually is, um, it, what makes sense in terms of business perspective. Maybe you can't monetize that, for instance, or maybe it's not kind of uh, aligned with the business strategy, for instance, uh, for that. And of course, like technical feasibility, um, you know, the earlier you can talk to uh, to your engineering counterpart, the better. Um, so that's why kind of technical expertise for product managers is super important. Initially, you should be able to kind of have a gut reaction about uh, is this is this hard to do? Is it even possible? How long would it take? That sort of thing. Um, so technical feasibility and of course is a you know, UX perspective. UX is what makes or breaks the product. So um, um, usability is extremely important. So when you're kind of developing your product roadmap, you take all of these into account and you come up with a, you know, product features, 
right? Like initially, of course, we have your product strategy and vision. I definitely recommend writing out the vision in a document format. Um, and uh, you have, uh, let's say all, all of that is done. Now you're at the product roadmap stage, then you actually outline all of these features and then you have to rigorously prioritize, right? Like I, I feel like most of the time product managers are spending time in prioritizing. Um, what what is more important to do um, than uh, than other things? What can wait? What cannot wait? And for that, of course, you need to be relentless about users uh, and customers. What is it that they want? And of course, that gets back to the whole uh, problem that you thought through in the beginning, right? So, like, is this actually a problem that needs solving? For sure. Um, space. I think. Yeah, I think I answered that. I think we could take one or two more questions. I see somebody's asking one question a few times. They really want an answer. So Azhan Jabbar Khanum is asking your advice for young software managers, please, or also soft or software business developers, or both. Gotcha. Software managers. Um, I personally have never been a software manager. I'm assuming software engineering manager. They mean software development manager. My mm -hmm. sister is one. Uh, so, but um, but I've worked with so many software engineering managers. Um, uh, you know, in in my career. Um, so my advice would be. Uh, I think that the not for young, uh, they say you're saying young software managers, like one um, one um, problem they uh, or younger ones they kind of get into is that they're too in the weeds, too much in the weeds, too technical because they were coding before, right? Now they're actually it's just super. It's, it's it's comfortable for them to kind of to get back into that coding um, mindset, and I would say just pull out of that. You know, you're a manager at this point, and your job is to develop a software development team. Right, like developing your team and just actually thinking about the whole like strategy from product pers uh, from engineering perspective. What should be the right architecture? What should be the right platform? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff is far more important. Um, another one is just going back to the developing the teams. So making sure that other software engineers um, are utilized for their um, for their full capacity and for their full potential, and they're happy and um, they're growing because uh, most software engineers they actually are hungry for challenge. They want to grow. They want to get better. They want to tackle harder and bigger problems. And um, great software and uh, software managers, uh, software engineer managers, actually tap into that and develop their teams and grow their teams. Yeah, so that's what I would say. Yeah, thank you so much. And let's take one last question from Gulhaya Arabova. What kind of advice do you have for girls that are going abroad to study soon and begin their academic career in IT? And what kind of skills are more crucial for girls? Uh, I would not say like some skills are more crucial for girls than you know for for guys. I think just in general, coming abroad um, to study. I'm assuming she is studying um, uh, computer science or some sort of a technical. Um, in, in the technical field, um, it, it is. I, I, I guess about like the 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 part for women though is that it will feel um, alienating sometimes. Um, to to be in the tech field as a woman, it, it's actually you know my whole entire career, right? I've I've been a minority, as, you know, as a woman because it's a very male dominated field. And as you um, move, as you expand, as you um, grow in your career, especially in leadership roles, it gets even more and more sad, right? Like there are even less, more less and less women uh, in leadership positions. So I think just kind of that's the reality, unfortunately, right? Like we're really working hard to solve that, but that is the reality, and it starts with school. In school as well, it's definitely not 50-50. Um, you know, there's, there are less women than men. Um, a lot of guys, they might have, um, just guessing, but which historically tends to be true, they start coding at younger ages. Um, because especially Gulhaya, if you're coming from Uzbekistan, probably you haven't had too much exposure into actually kind of working with computers, right? Like in coding and that sort of thing. Um, maybe guys have had a little bit more exposure, but de definitely do not let that intimidate you. 
mm-hmm. right? Like every, you can learn everything. Um, you need to, if you need to put your mind to it, um, you need to dream big, you need to, you know, um, have concrete plans and you need to really work hard. Um, one thing my dad would always tell me um, that when I was preparing to come to the U.S. that as a foreigner, you have to work twice harder, right? So he would always tell me, like, be prepared for that, right? Like, as a foreigner, you have to work, you know, um, two times harder than Americans because, you know, there's other factors. There's a language factor, there's a cultural factor and all that kind of stuff. One thing he did not know, though, that as a woman, I w- had to work even harder, Right. So like he was, he's not a woman. He didn't know the challenges, especially in the tech field. Um, and uh, so there was like an additional kind of component to that. That's why I studied you know, harder than my American counterparts. Um, I, I, you know, I gave it extra. I prepared hard like more. Um, that sort of thing, but all of that is completely um, it, it's rewarding. I would say it's just it might feel unfair um, initially, but just have that mindset. Right. Um, and also ask for things when you see unfairness and you, you, you're seeing, you know, your male counterparts are treat, getting treated um, and getting promoted, for instance, or getting, you know, like whatever, right? Like getting discovered, you know, for opportunities uh, unfairly, I would just say always speak up uh, and escalate and try to make noise and that sort of thing, because we definitely should not take accept unfairness um and biases um and we should all work hard um to to eliminate them wow it's been an hour and a half i was so into this i didn't even realize honestly um i know there's a few more questions so before we end the interview uh is there a way that people could contact you perhaps if they have more further questions or any more advice they need what would be the best way for them to contact you yeah. Uh, so when you guys post this video, there's a. It will be on YouTube, right? Uh, oh, like we can comment or. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I you can post it there. Um, if you're if they're comfortable sharing their questions, otherwise, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, would love to help out uh, in whichever way I can. Awesome. So yes, if. Um, anyone has any questions, as Shahina said, you guys can leave them under this post. She will do her best to answer or reach out to her on LinkedIn, which Shahina Pulatova would be her name. So honestly, thank you so, so much, Shahina, for joining us today. This was one like a very, very interactive session. You know, so many questions along the way and everybody's so inspired by you and so amazed by all of your accomplishments. We're really wishing you the best of luck in your future um, career goals and your personal travel goals. It was real, really amazing to have you. And also, along, um, you know, to that point, thank you to everyone who joined this amazing session with Shahina and for asking questions. I hope you guys really like the session. So yeah, with that I think we can end the interview. And if you have any last Thanks. words, Shahina, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shahadat, for an amazing interview. I had so much fun. Um, and to Uzbek for, for you know having me here. Uh, I'm extremely grateful that you guys are doing this. This is super important. And um, you know, just for the Uzbek community to get connected, um, people who are abroad. So I appreciate all the hard, hard work that you are all putting into this. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.